Hi everyone, uh, my name's Liam Lybird and I'm doing a PhD in the History Department on uh, in what's entitled Race, Gender and Empire on the British Radical Right 1920 to 1960. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the Battle of Cable Street but also the importance of the 1930s as a period of history more generally. Uh, so, uh, as you may or may not know, a little over 80 years ago, on October 4th, 1936, the residents of London's East End, including Jewish people, Irish people, communists, socialists, anarchists and trade unionists, came together to halt a fascist march. Uh, the march was the fourth anniversary celebration of the founding of Oswald Mosley's British Union of Fascists, or BUF for short, uh, and 100,000 anti-fascist protesters barred the way of 2,000 fascist marches, uh, and the police were sent to clear the route, uh, so the ensuing clashes between the police, the fascists and the anti-fascists became known as the Battle of Cable Street. So 80 years on, the Battle of Cable Street is remembered as a symbol of resistance against the far right. Uh, last September, I was lucky enough to interview uh, two of the few veterans of Cable Street still with us. Uh, one was called Alf Seller, and he witnessed the event itself, as well as the atmosphere leading up to it. And the other one was called Willie Myers, and he was a young and incredibly active anti-fascist uh, who participated in the battle. Uh, so I'd like to give a bit of context first. So the 1930s is an immensely interesting period of history, as I've already said. Uh, across Europe, it was a time of economic crisis and political extremism. Uh, authoritarian nationalist leaders were coming to power uh, with the promise of making their respective nations great again. In 1933, Hitler became German Chancellor and quickly set about consolidating his power, turning the country to, into a totalitarian dictatorship. By the start of the decade, the original fascist dictator, Benito Mussolini, had already been in power for several years. Bitter political tensions in, uh, in Austria in 1934 and in Spain in 1936 led to civil war between fascists and anti-fascists. Elsewhere, there were extreme nationalist groups in Poland, Romania, Greece, Croatia, Portugal, Hungary, Norway, France, and Britain. So, to Britain, um, Oswald Moses' British Union of Fascists was not the first group on the British political scene to call itself fascist. However, it became the largest and most influential fascist party in Britain during the 1930s. It was thought, formed in 1932, and its membership reached its height in the summer of 1934, uh, with estimates in the region of 40 to 50,000 members. The BUF campaigned in a, in a number of areas across the country, running candidates in local and national elections. In particular, they targeted the cotton-producing areas of Lancashire and the manufacturing towns and cities across Yorkshire. In 1934, they actually held a meeting at City Hall, just up the road. Uh, after around 1936, much of their campaigning, was, uh, campaigning efforts became concentrated on the east end of London. Uh, so for many years before the Second World War, the East End was home to a large and vibrant Jewish community. The BUF didn't like this, and they mounted a campaign of violence, hate and intimidation against the Jewish residents of the East End. So the Battle of Cable Street was one of many acts of organised resistance against the BUF's racist campaign. So both of my interviewees from Jewish families that lived in the East End, Alf Seller was 10 when he witnessed part of the Battle of Cable Street. His memories of life in the East End were of a place where fascist meetings were a staple feature. He remembers the weekly meetings held by the BUF at the corner of Philpot Street and Commercial Road. So as the day itself approached, Alf was aware that a lot of the adults appeared to be discussing some kind of event. On the day, Alf decided to try and get to Cable Street. He found his original route blocked by two men who threatened him with a good hiding if he didn't go back home. Undeterred, Alf tried a different route and managed to get to Gardener's Corner where the protesters were gathering. He saw Irish dock workers, who were also the, the target of the BUF's racism, had come out to march alongside the Jews and other anti-fascists. Alf saw the beginnings of mounted police charges against the protesters and saw protesters chucking ball bearings under the feet of police horses to trip them, a popular image in many recollections of the battle. At that point, he told me, he thought to himself he really better get home in case he did get caught up in some real trouble. <laughs> Willie Myers was right in the middle of the trouble that day. He was 15 and a member of the Young Communist League and played the bugle in the Communist Party band. He'd converted to the cause of communism uh, by his next door neighbor, Max Levitas, who was a prominent anti-fascist who was still alive and politically active today, aged 101. Willie was deeply involved in the politics of the time. He and his friends used to spend their free time breaking up fascist meetings. He saw the local fight against fascism as a continuation of the fight going on all across Europe. Two of Willie's friends even went to fight in, in, went off to fight in the Spanish Civil War that had started earlier that July. One was never to return. On the day itself, Willie and his friends built a barricade out of a flatbed lorry and some broken furniture on Christian Street, a road that connects uh, Cable Street to the main road in the East End, Commercial Road. Willie was struck by the show of unity uh, by, shown by local residents as they came together to fight both the fascists and the police. Willie's trust in the police was shaken that day 
by his horror at their use of heavy-handed tactics. So with huge crowds blocking the path of the march and repeated police efforts uh, to clear the, mar uh, clear the route, coming to nothing, uh, BUF leader Oswald Mosley agreed to call off the march at the request of police officials. Willie remembers at that point that there was a cry of relief and everybody went mad. Willie later joined the RAF and helped defeat fascism in Europe during the Second World War. On his return, he continued his left-wing anti-fascist activism. He feels a sense of personal pride in the part he played in fighting fascism, though haste, hastens to add that he was only one of hundreds of thousands. While these were in themselves brilliant stories, they also reveal important issues about how the Battle of Cable Street is remembered. While Alf's memories were fairly unpolitical, Willie's were seething with politics. For Willie, the story was as fresh and the struggle as urgent as if it happened yesterday and not 80 years ago. Also, the popular anti-fascist account of Cable Street admits the fact that, at least in the short term, the BUF actually experienced an increase in membership in East London immediately after the battle, though it appears that Mosley's defeat at the hands of the anti-fascist protesters actually harmed his standing with other fascist leaders such as Hitler and Mussolini. Partly as a result of the Cable Street defeat, Mussolini, who had secretly been funding the BUF until this point, stopped sending them money. Another thing often downplayed or airbrushed out of the history of Cable Street was the anti-fascist use of violence. People didn't simply turn out to peacefully counter-protest. They came ready and willing to use uh, violence against the fascists. And Willie didn't like this, but believed it was quite right under those circumstances, and said if necessary, he would do it all again. He believed that the use of violence against fascists during the, Spanish, uh, during the Battle of Cable Street was as necessary as the use of violence against fascists during the Spanish Civil War and later during the Second World War. This frankness seems shocking to modern sensibilities, which often associate political violence with the threat of terrorism. The Battle of Cable Street in the 1930s more, uh, generally seem more significant now than ever. Historical parallels between the 1930s and the present abound in newspaper opinion pieces and on current affairs discussion programmes. And Willie saw them too. He lamented that, I get angry sometimes, angry at times that the lessons of the war haven't been learned. At the mention of Nigel Farage, Willie said, when I close my eyes I can hear Mosley. The same sort of rhetoric. But Willie was defiant, insisting I would willingly do it all again, even now, without a shadow of a doubt. The interviews were a reminder that sometimes history is really current affairs, and as a historian of the 1930s, I deal with dark and divisive ideologies that have afterlives that we can still see all around us. In June last year, Thomas Mayer reportedly shouted Britain first, an old, uh, an old BUF slogan, as he opened fire on the MP for Batley and Spen, Joe Cox, before stabbing her to death in the street. A couple of weekends ago, the English Defence League marched through Rotherham Town Centre. This was the most recent in a series of far-right marches which have cost South Yorkshire Police £5 million since 2012. These histories, which are both past and present, for me underline the urgency and the importance of the history of the 1930s for everyone, professional historian or not. Thank you very much. <laughs>